Welcome one and all as we jump into another day of the news. It's still here and thus we have to be. We've got a contract after all. I'm John Iarola, this is the Damage Report. And we are very lucky to be joined today by Jessica Burbank herself. How's it going, Burbs? John has started the show with, I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> well, Basically, no. yeah. I don't know, like you gotta at least phone it in or whatever, but I'll try to add a little bit of style to it. No, I'm kidding. I'm actually very excited about the news today because the news today is utterly ridiculous. We have accusations of people being witches or maybe possessed by demons or maybe both. It depends on the cultural traditions of your, your country. Um, we've got uh, burgers landing in East Palestine. So to whatever extent burgers can solve the lack of regulation, everything <laughs> that I think we're good. Um, and a whole lot more besides woke Legos and Kyle Rittenhouse needs your money and just a lot of crazy stuff. Bernie trying to do the right thing. You love to see it. So anyway, I'm very excited about the news. Jessica, it's been a bit since you've been on. How have you been weathering America? Yeah, <laughs> I'm in a lawsuit with the landlord, which is like the most American thing you mm -hmm. can do, right? Yeah, so it's, God bless. it's pretty classical. That's the American dream. Mm -hmm. Or I think being the landlord's the American dream. I don't know. You're you're part of the story, right. <laughs> anyway. To so um, know your rights works out. that you can one day sue. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, hope it works out. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but if I can help it anyway, feel free to let me know. Um, sorry, you're dealing with that. Uh, okay, everybody, we've got a lot, as I alluded to, that we're going to be dealing with today on the show. So let's make sure that we have as many people at our back as possible by hitting the like button and thus juicing that algorithm. And along the way, if you want to reach out to Jessica or myself with any questions, comments, concerns, maybe funny little bits of news, insightful remarks, you might get a $100 Blue Apron gift card. Um, it's your best chance anyway. So send those in and we'll respond as we go. And with all that said, Jessica, are you ready to start the show? I was born ready, John. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just became ready. It took me a little. It took me a little bit longer. In that case, though, let's go. What's your specialty today? <laughs> How are you today? Nice, nice to meet you. you. Hello, everybody. That's a nice, beautiful-looking group of people. So I know this menu better than you do. Okay. I probably know it better than anybody in here. Uh, we're going to take care of the fire department. Okay. We're going to take care of the police department. Okay, we have fact checked his statement and for the first time ever, Donald Trump was telling the truth. He does in fact know it better than anyone, uh, including me. And I actually, I go to McDonald's probably more than I should from the point of view of my doctor, probably also my wife. In any event, Donald Trump is there. He's arrived in East Palestine, so don't worry. He brought uh, pallets of water, uh, Trump water. He brought uh, Big Macs, or at least got them when he got there, and uh, he distributed the water, which you know people really do need. They're worried about uh, the state of the water, the state of the air, the state of the ground, and they don't necessarily trust these supposedly independent tests coming out of Norfolk Southern, uh, saying that everything's great, just go about your lives. In addition to that, he reassured the cashier at McDonald's that they were going to take care of the firefighters. I'm not sure if that was something that she was worrying about at that moment. But the camera was rolling, more importantly. And so they did do that. They bought Big Macs for the firefighters. So Donald Trump is terrible, generally. That's true. This was 100% for PR. Let's be clear about that. But that said, is it still a good thing? Has he, people love to throw around the term outflanked or whatever, but like, at least in terms of PR, has he outflanked Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg, Jessica Burbank? What do you think? Okay, if I burned down somebody's house and the family was distraught and they're staying in a hotel and I brought them a Big Mac, would that change what I did? Because like President Trump was responsible for a lot of these rail regulations being rescinded. They were gonna make yeah. sure trains have better you know, tracks to run on or better brakes so that they can stop when they're going so fast. Anybody who's mm -hmm. played with trains as a kid knows if they go super fast, they're gonna fly off the track. So there was a, a regulatory <laughs> measure to make sure that they had good brakes on them. But mm -hmm. Trump's campaign took a bunch of money from the rail lobby. And then when he was in office, they decided, you know what, we're not gonna regulate. We're not gonna enforce this regulation. Yep. And then he shows up and he's like, here's some Trump branded water. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know if I, I think this is helpful. Yeah, well, maybe not too helpful. I will say uh, if you were to burn down someone's house and then show up at their <laughs> motel room with a Big Mac for <laughs> them, that would not solve their problem, but it would be a pretty 
boss move. That'd be a power move right there. <laughs> Insult to injury in the form of a, of a Big Mac. But anyway, um, yes, look, this this is not actually going to solve all of their problems. And I don't, obviously it's not gonna solve the rail related problems to be clear. It's not really gonna fundamentally solve their problems that have just come about as a result of the disaster. Um, but it looks good, it looks good and I'm sure Look, if you're a conservative and you live in the area, or even if you don't, if you're just conservative, you must love this. And uh, you know, I don't really even begrudge you that. I, I wish that you could acknowledge at the same time that this is 100% for PR. And I wish, as Jessica alluded to, and as we'll get into more, you acknowledge the issue of deregulation and all that. But but stunts are a part of politics, and of of Trump stunts, this is better than some. This is better than him throwing paper towels at people who are still rebuilding from Hurricane Maria. It's it's better than serving those same Big Macs to athletes who visit you at the White House. This is at least in the same neighborhood as helpful. And um, I'm curious going forward what's gonna happen because he pledged to donate thousands of bottles of cleaning supplies and yet more water. Those are pledges though, like he did bring some water, That that is clear, he did do that. Is there going to be an ongoing thing like a pledge once the cameras stop rolling? That's I think a little bit more up in the air. I also want to point out there's been like a lot of like informal fact checking or whatever around the water with people pointing out like with this sort of graphic that Trump natural spring water actually was discontinued back in 2010. So is this water like 13 years old? And I, I wouldn't put that past him, but that does not appear to actually be what's going on. He has his own branded water or whatever that he doesn't produce. They just put a label on it for his resorts and stuff. That looks like what they're actually passing out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a, a pass on that. Um, but really fast though, Jessica. So you, I think you rightly point out he hasn't solved their problem. But was this the right move for him, given the state of the Republican primary and all that? It, it certainly makes him look good in comparison to Ron DeSantis, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think by the rules of the game, as defined by you know strange political consultants in Washington D.C. who do this for a living, it's a good political stunt, right? I love the idea that Donald Trump could have been like, you know what, we're trucking the water from 2010 out of that warehouse in Secaucus, New Jersey, and we're going to East Palestine, and we're doing it while Joe Biden is in Ukraine, and the narrative has been, why are we giving all of our money and resources to Ukraine? By the current rules of the game and the current narrative, it's a good political stunt. Also yeah. hilarious to tell McDonald's employees, you know the menu better than them. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't think the menu's that long. I'm pretty sure they know all of it. If I had a guess, I would say they know all of the menu actually. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, look, I, I long ago pledged many years ago. I made a solemn pledge to the audience that I would never ever be fair to Donald Trump. So don't worry, <laughs> I'm gonna be insulting him soon. Um, but I do have to acknowledge that some people at that McDonald's did seem excited to see him. I feel bad for them. I'm trying to reach those people, but they did seem to be excited. So maybe credit to him for that. What do you make of Biden or rather Buttigieg's criticism of you pulling back rail regulations? Do you think you would have made no, it had different? nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do. Well, look, this is obviously classic Donald Trump. I take no responsibility for anything. He's never ever taken responsibility for the obvious predictable and predicted consequences of the terrible decisions that he's made. Why would he start now at 90 years of age? It's too late for that, but we're gonna fact check him. He did do bad things that maybe in this case might have stopped this disaster from happening. I'm not gonna jump ahead of what we know and say, this wouldn't have happened, but we do know what his approach to rail regulations were. Article from 2018 made clear back then, this is years and years ago, Trump rolls back train braking rule meant to keep oil tankers from exploding near communities. Now that's not exactly what happened. They were toxic chemicals rather than oil. I'll leave it up to you to figure out whether that's better or worse. But under Trump, the Department of Transportation justified the rollback with a 2018 analysis arguing the cost of requiring such breaks would be significantly higher than the expected benefits of the update. Of course, that's the Department of Transportation under Trump, which is a significant part of this. But also, I love that. Don't you love that math? The cost of it is higher than the benefit. But isn't the crazy thing that they seem to be missing that the costs and the benefits don't go to the same people. 
Like, it's not like the cost and benefit for them. The cost is for them. The benefit to not derailing the train is for all of these other people. Weird that they don't acknowledge that. And by the way, Donald Trump not only pulled back so many of these regulations and not just on trains, things like methane emissions and food regulations, lots of different stuff. He was super excited about it and the right loved it. He would tweet things like, I am continuing to get rid of costly and unnecessary regulations. Much work left to do, but effect will be great. Businesses and jobs will grow and sometimes we'll have to set fire to thousands of pounds of toxic volatile chemicals. By the way, another fact check, that tweet was not actually in reference to that fortune article. A lot of people are tweeting them out as if that's what he was responding to. That's not actually the case. I went back and checked the original thing. But he was bragging about deregulation. And I really hope, Jessica, that coming out of this, people are reminded that regulations are just protections. That's all it is. It's protections for regular people. But they've been so demonized for literally decades that a lot of people think of them as just like petty, tyrannical attempts to constrain business growth. Right, exactly. This is a this whole thing is a blip in our lifelong fight to get Americans to realize that correlation is not causation. Yeah. Uh, so often we're like, well, this thing happened. These train derailments happened when Pete Buttigieg was, you know, transportation secretary and Biden was president. So naturally, those must be the people responsible for not regulating the trains. Uh, but if you look into it for 30 more seconds, you can see who is actually responsible for it. Every time something like this happens, I believe we are closer to realizing that correlation is not causation as a nation, <laughs> but I could be wrong. Uh, and it's a terrible problem, the cost benefit analysis situation that so many corporations have all of these negative externalities, right? They might be profiting, they might be doing well, but they're causing this huge problem for all of these people that have no business or benefit in the rail industry. They're not profiting, they don't have stock in it. Maybe they pick up some stuff off of the shelves that was transported by the trains yeah. or transported by the trains. But it's not the kind of cost benefit analysis where they're considering these people could have cancer for the rest of their lives. What is the cost to them for treating yeah. that cancer? What is the impact on Medicare, Medicaid? Uh, usually they don't go that far, but they should. Yeah. Yeah, it's that classic thing of uh, we as a nation constantly focus on wealth rather than the commonwealth. It's can we mm -hmm. make line go up rather than can we keep people from being needlessly sickened by vinyl chloride to burn. Um, so I agree. Also, I love the idea of the correlation causation nation. That's <laughs> if I ever start doing uh, bar trivia again, that's going to be our name. <laughs> anyway, um, you know what? Uh, apologies to the TD. Can we go a little bit out of order? Can we jump ahead to that last video first? Because I want to continue on this topic of regulations. Whenever you're ready, let's jump to uh, Fox and Friends. I, I knew nothing about these derailment numbers. I'm stunned by it. Uh -huh. That we have thousands of derailments all the time and what the, how costly it is and, and how they're not kept up. And maybe the regulation needs to be there. I think there needs to be, uh, there's a widespread sentiment to have a, a look at the whole rail industry, what the lobbyists are doing and, and what the actual, I heard there were three people on that train of how many cars, but I just think we got to look at this. And as Governor DeWine said, I had no idea this toxic chemicals were coming through these towns. Yeah. At least we should be alerted to it. I think that's a reasonable request. Well, and sure. Pete Buttigieg even said, we have thousands of these tra train derailments quite often, and that is alarming. This could happen to your town. Don't you love when three fully grown adults whose job it is and has been for many years to respond to the news? discover what government regulations are and why they might be necessary. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. I like I like lifelong learning. I like that they were able to do that. It took a while, longer than most, but they got there. They got there. Look, I'm joking a little bit. Um, kill me, you know, every once in a while is just absolute the worst. He also is sometimes amongst the most reasonable people on Fox. Like he talked right there like a regular person realizing that we've been screwed over by the system and something needs to be done. And he's exposing millions of his viewers to that idea, which we try to do on a regular basis. So I feel a little bit closer to kill me today. Burbank, what do you think? I love this. This reporter is like, why haven't I heard about this? Dude, you're the person that other people hear about stuff from. You're supposed <laughs> to be the one looking into it and finding out and telling people about it. He's just like, well, I've just realized that I don't quite do my job. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. 
But the, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, you guys, isn't Fox and Friends the most watched news political show in the nation? <laughs> if not you, who do see? Um, but also, just the the philosophical underpinning of that. Wait a second. They've made decisions that are made to benefit corporations rather than us. I think we should look into this. You know what, Kilmeade? I agree. I think we should probably look into this. But anyway, um, let's 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 normalize this sort of thing. I don't know that they would have done this if it was if it was under Trump. Maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they're freed up to acknowledge that the government we should be able to expect more from it, thanks to Biden being president. But I will also give them a little bit more credit. They later in that show acknowledged the deregulation that took place under the Trump administration. They mentioned the break thing. And again, I think they're a little bit freed up to do that in that they're desperately hoping that Meatball Ron takes down McDonald's Don. Um, But they did acknowledge it. Like they told a Fox audience that Trump deregulated during his whole PR burger fests that he's having right now. So credit to them for that. Any other thoughts? I think it's funny that instead of them acknowledging the deregulations and issue that it's actually a regular thing that toxic chemicals are transported on trains. They're like, well, why didn't they tell us about these chemicals? And they make it like a conspiracy that this was intentionally done and is an exception and not the rule. Yeah, 100%. And tomorrow's report is gonna be, I just looked into it. It turns out (laughs) they were making money off of this. And I wasn't making any. Why didn't anyone <laughs> tell me that I wasn't benefiting? Okay, keep up the good work. <laughs> Kill me, Ducey, and whoever that was. Um, okay, that said, th- this might be petty, this one little added nugget that we're gonna jump into, but I am going to take any opportunity over the next, I'll say, three to six months to remind people of one of the most epic unveilings of fundamental hypocrisy that I've seen in politics. But to get there, we need to start with this. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, when he's unleashed in a crowd of people, he's pretty unbelievable. If you haven't seen the tape of him ordering at McDonald's in East Palestine, treat yourself. Treat yourself. I just, it's its really amazing. I mean, we watched it on the show. He walked up to a group of people and told them that he knew the menu of McDonald's. It was a good move for him. I even gave him credit, but like, it wasn't the most amazing thing ever, Tucker. Calm down. He hasn't been that flushed in the face since before they changed the footwear of the lady M&M. But anyway, um, the point of that clip is Tucker Carlson wants to assure the MAGA people, "Oh, I still love this guy. He is the absolute best. And he needs to potentially do that to make them not focus on the fact that it was revealed just days ago that he called Trump a quote, demonic force. He's a guy who is good at destroying things. The undisputed world champion of that. He could easily destroy us if we play it wrong. Well, what would playing it right look like? Apparently, if he's the genius we're led to believe, what you just saw is him playing it right. Call him a demon and a destroyer of worlds behind the scenes, and then pretend that his um, his McChicken stunt is the most like the best display of empathy we've ever seen in American politics. Do that publicly and hope that people don't realize the massive gap between those two positions. Jessica, what do you think about this? The way Tucker said unleash him, um, <laughs> he's kind of giving away that he thinks he's a bit dangerous, isn't he? That's true. I mean, on his show, he's like, I love it when they unleash Donald Trump on a crowd. And then behind the scenes, he's like, yeah, I think that guy's a demon. It's like, yeah, I think he Tucker. unleashed something. <laughs> uh, no, you're right with the language, though. Like, you know, like when there's like a disaster and people need medical help and then they unleash the nurses. You know, like, no, you unleash bad things. You unleash the Kraken. That's literally what you do. Not good, reasonable, normal things. I'm a little bit hungry. Can you unleash lunch? No, that's not how that works. But anyway, there's actually. What's that? Unleash the news for us. Exactly. I'm going to start every show from now on with that. You know what? Um, Actually, can you unleash the next video? Pete Buttigieg has not shown up. Donald Trump has, by the way, he went today. He's not able to fix the problem. It's not like he's the Secretary of Transportation. But Trump did bring pallets of bottled water and then bought the entire fire department dinner at McDonald's. Whatever you think of Trump, at least he cared enough to go there. That's something. That's something he cared enough to try. I mean, he did more 
in that than Tucker would do in this segment because you'll notice that Tucker's not gonna mention the deregulation that Trump did. He must not have like a multi-million dollar team of producers, I assume. They just don't have the time or the resources to talk about the actual substance behind this. And by the way, here's a fun little thought experiment. If Pete Buddha judge, as he insists on mispronouncing every single Democrat's names, although he did do a better job than Trump did in that appearance, calling him boot edge edge in a super exaggerated way. If Buttigieg showed up to East Palestine with some pallets of water and then bought whoppers for everyone, do you think that Tucker Carlson would be applauding him today? If Biden had done that, do you think that he would be talking about how, you know, I don't agree with him on everything, but you gotta give him credit, they tried. What do you think, Jessica, how much credit would they be getting? Probably not much, but then we wouldn't get this beautiful graphic. The right is learning to be funny. We get Pete Buttigieg swinging over the smoldering remains of a town. I mean, then we get this clip of Donald Trump <laughs> in a McDonald's. They're they're giving us some comedy and we can thank That's them. That's true. That. Can, can we go back to the video for just a sec? Cause I actually completely missed that. Can we just oh, yeah. bring that up maybe without sound? Um, I know the graphic design is a passion of Tucker Carlson's. Yeah, look at oh, that. It's pretty that's good. Mild, that's mildly funny. But again, <laughs> like if the idea is that like Buttigieg is having fun while a disaster is going on, Trump is having fun with burgers while a disaster is going on, a disaster that he potentially helped contribute to. So again, it's this willful blindness, um, but that's how he has become incredibly wealthy. So I won't begrudge him that. It is time to unleash the B block. Let's talk about this. The at least day long media tour of the four women in the grand jury operating in the Fulton County investigation of Donald Trump uh, drew a lot of criticism. I think it's fair to say we were a little bit critical of her uh, choosing to do this yesterday on the show. Uh, that said, some of the criticism coming from the right has uh, quickly moved into territory I would call deranged. Uh, we're gonna start off with someone who is comparatively keeping it together. And you wouldn't expect this coming from Donald Trump, who bleated, this Georgia case is ridiculous. A strictly political continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Now you have an extremely energetic young woman, the get this four person. What's the get this on the four person? Is that like a person rather than man or woman thing? I don't even understand what point you're trying to make, but anyway. He says of the racist DA's special grand jury going around and doing a media tour revealing incredibly the grand jury's inner workings and thoughts. This is not justice, this is an illegal capital K kangaroo court. Atlanta is leading the nation in murder and other violent crimes. All I did is make two perfect phone calls. I um, There's a lot that I don't understand about that. I'm not sure what the reference to the racist DA is. I know well, that he calls. He calls the woman in the Southern District of New York racist for some reason. What are they all racist? Is he getting mixed up about which investigation he's talking about? I don't know. It's hard to focus on the weird racist thing with all the misogyny that's just slathered over that. But uh, Burbank, what do you think? I think it's because Fannie Willis in Georgia, uh, her father was a Black Panther. So when she was talking oh, about- Oh, okay. Uh, she was very happy with the racial makeup of the jury. She says, you know, my father fought for our right to vote. So I think it's because she's anti-racist and conservatives believe that means they are racist. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that makes some sense uh, inside of his insanity. Uh, all I did is make two perfect phone calls. First <laughs> of all, even if they were perfect, which they weren't, uh, that is not all that you did when it comes to Fulton County, let alone Georgia, let alone America. Let's be clear about that. Uh, but I do want to remind people because it's now been like two plus years since that perfect phone call. Just one of the things he said, and the transcript's available. You can go read how much pressure he and his team were putting on Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State. Just one of the things he said was, I just want to find 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. That's very specifically a direct quote. I just want you to find find exactly the amount of votes I need to win. I don't know why it takes two years to figure out if he was trying to change the results, the illegally change the results of the election. It's obvious, it's explicit in that statement, but we're supposed to pretend 
that this is hard to figure out, that we gotta get into motivations and how perfect the call was. In any event, while we're doing that, it mildly sucks that now the fact that the four person went on the media means that they get to attack her, which they are. His lawyers joined in, one of them uh, named Findling says, the end product is the reliability of anything that has taken place in there is completely tainted and called into question. He said that he held no chagrin for a 30 year old four person who was part of a failed system. She's a product of a circus that cloaked itself as a special purpose grand jury. It's not a joking matter, it's not a matter for giggles, it's not a matter for smiles. And I find that to be ironic because I'm imagining that if you serve as a lawyer for Donald Trump, you've probably more than once in your life told a woman to just give you a little smile. So now all of a sudden when she does, you don't like it anymore. Um, but they are using this, Jessica, as a lot of people predicted to try to throw out preemptively the indictments that might or might not even be coming. What do you think? I'm just like upset that it takes a DA in Atlanta, Georgia to do what Merrick Garland should have done so long ago. I mean, the evidence is so obvious. Why are we putting all of this pressure on not only this district attorney in Atlanta, but now this jury of just American citizens that were called mm -hmm. upon to do their civic duty. And now someone with a huge base is targeting the four person of the jury putting them in a really dangerous situation. Like to me, it's terrible that Trump is doing this. Of course it's wrong, but it's also a failure of Merrick Garland that we're in this situation at all. Yeah, no, totally. Like we, we should not have to pin our hopes on these little regional or local or county level investigations. I mean, they, they, they have their perfect legal right to undergo these things or whatever, but it shouldn't rely on this. Like the phone call was not perfect, it was terrible, but how does that compare to the coup that he launched? It seems relatively mild in comparison to that. They're connected, include it, whatever. But the, the coup's the bad thing. Um, so it's it's weird, and, and I and I agree. Like that's why I'm not trying to put too much on the four person. The four person was apparently reached out to and asked to appear on the news. And by the way, if this does hurt the case, then yeah, I think that she in effect will be somewhat responsible. Uh, you know, at this late stage of the game, but the media that asked her to come on is also responsible. They know that that's not how this stuff is supposed to go. In any event, yeah. um, oh, sorry, Jessica, continue. Just can a, a phone call be perfect and criminal? I would say probably yes. Uh, one day I aspire to make a perfect phone call as well that is not criminal. But the <laughs> interesting thing that he calls the justice system corrupt. Uh, he appointed so many Supreme Court justices that overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, they overturned popular policy in the United States. And for yeah. some reason, the system that he doesn't like is one in which people have to stand for election to become a district attorney. Like it's yeah. just anti-democratic, that criticism of the justice system. Well, and, and this is this is the game that they play in everything. Like yeah. Elon Musk was berating his engineers for like not being able to explain how he was being shadow banned. Dude, you own it. Like they can literally own the system and still attack the system as being unfair. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. those as I alluded to earlier, those criticisms from Donald Trump and his lawyers, I think are at least grounded in some sort of conspiratorial reality. Uh, it gets crazier from there. She's weird, she's not just weird. She's like borderline demonic. I look at the, I mean, you can tell this, like look at the gyrations of the eyes, the strange squirreliness and weirdness of the motion in her. And if you don't believe me that we're fighting a spiritual battle between darkness and light, that is exhibit A. Weird demon possessed girl coming after Donald Trump because she's believed all of the filth and propaganda that's been vomited into her face by the media. I'm going after Orange Hitler. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to take him out. Very cool. Uh yeah, she believes all the filth and propaganda. Dude, this, this whoever that guy is, he he believes the filth and propaganda. He just likes the filth and propaganda. I love his criticism of her like her facial expressions, her eyes, like he can't wait to do that exact same stuff. What a weirdo. Anyway, um, this is the state of the right wing. That guy just declares that she's demon possessed, talks about this struggle to get Donald Trump back into the White House so they can cut the corporate tax rate as being some sort of biblical fight between good and evil. 
it can't just be that maybe it was strategically a misstep for her to appear. She has to be inhabited by Asmodeus, Lord of Goats or something. It's just, it's a really weird, it's a weird environment in the media that we have, Jessica. I think you put it really well when you said this is the state of the right wing, because I think it's a great synopsis of what's going on there. I mean, you have this guy who's very upset that um, his politician that he likes, Donald Trump, is being prosecuted for trying to steal an election. Like, that's what we're talking about here. That's what he's upset about. He's like, objection, your honor, motion for a mistrial because the judge is a bit wiggly. Um, when <laughs> on the left, what are we upset about? We're upset that people are being detained. We're upset that people are being detained for minor drug offenses and being put in prison for life. We're seeing people in arraignments being put in jail without even a trial simply because they are poor, also because they are black. And then we see right next to them, their peers who are white, you know, not being put in jail. And it's like, those those are our qualms with the justice system and how it operates. Instead, he's like, you know, I think the judge is a bit weird and I would like for him to not prosecute, prosecute the bad guy who yeah. I kind of like. It's also just like, again, it's projection constantly. Like yeah. you, you it, the case should be thrown out because she believes crazy things about Trump in believing he thinks she believes that he's a fascist or whatever, which I feel like that's self evident. I feel like I don't need to make the case for that. I feel like Donald Trump does that on a daily basis. But anyway, uh, his side believes that Joe Biden and every prominent Democrat in America keeps kids chained in their basement so they can drink their brain hormones. Like, it's just project you guys believe the craziest stuff in the world about microchips and 5G and all that stuff. So maybe like, you know, get your own house in order. Um, but is she demon possessed or is there something else supernatural going on? Here is Charlie Kirk. And as soon as I saw it, I said, oh, wow, they have a Harry Potter girl running Trump's grand jury. As soon as I saw it. I have nothing against Harry Potter, I think it's fine. I read all the books growing up, but there is a culture that was created, especially with millennials where they got super obsessed about Harry Potter and they talk a certain way and they giggle a certain way. And I was like, that girl is, she thinks she's a witch. And we kind of had our, you know, chat about that in our conversation this morning. And it turns out that my suspicion actually was totally and completely correct that we found her Pinterest page, the Harry Potter girl's Pinterest page, and she's really into witchcraft. That's not an insult. Well, it is an insult, but it's not me exaggerating. It's not hyperbole. It's a fact. She's big into alchemy, crystals, how to be a witch. We have the images right here. She actually is a witch. She's into witchcraft. And as soon as I saw a video of her, I said, whoa, that is someone who thinks they're Hermione Granger, like totally. Like she's she is LARPing on live television, live action role playing, trying to be a serious person. She just she just can't pull it off. Yeah, listen, it you want to go be a witch in Georgia, not my thing. You could go into the hinterlands and go cast spells amongst your fellow friends. If you're gonna be a forewoman of a jury that involves a former president, you gotta be a lot more serious than this. This is not a joke. Okay, I don't want to waste any time. I want to dive immediately into the most substantive part of this. What did you call Hermione Granger? How did you pronounce that? You said you read all those books. I don't think you read all those books. You seem mystified by what her name actually is. Anyway, um, he's very happy with himself that he has established that she is in fact a witch. I'm gonna blow Charlie Kirk's mind. Did you know that she could be interested in witchcraft? And that doesn't necessarily mean that witchcraft is real. <laughs> In the same way that declaring her to be demon possessed doesn't mean that she actually is. All of this stuff that, yes, there are there are Wiccans and there are people who have this cultural thing and they engage in stuff and different people have different views of it. But you guys literally believe that all this stuff is true. There are concerned parents around the country going to school board meetings that think that witchcraft is a real thing and reading Harry Potter means you can literally cast spells. So again, like they're trying to put all of the things that they know are true of their base onto this one woman. And then they add a layer of misogyny, like her giggling and all that means that she's not serious or something. Um, so anyway, it, it's just, it, they have to, there's no reasonable criticism. They have to jump immediately to declaring her to be some sort of sprite or fairy or something like that. Some weird supernatural thing, Jessica. 
Yeah, uh, Hermione Granger. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I don't like that at all. I, think, I don't want that. Yeah, if I if any of my friends decide to go under you know hormone therapy and and transition, I think they should go with a new name of Hermione Granger, just as a slight to J.K. Rowling and all of the nonsense she's called. <laughs> and then they can tell everybody Charlie Kirk came up with it. And I think that yeah. was beautiful and poetic, but. It's ridiculous. Can't they think of something new? We already did the witch trials thing so long ago and we got <laughs> over it. And now they want to bring it back. And it's like, why are you digging up old stuff? Be creative, Charlie. Come up with something new. 100%. Also, I'm just going to throw out there um, everything at the end of the day, I think, is really about branding. Okay. Because mm -hmm. take a look at how quick he was to spit in the face of someone who believes in alchemy and herbs they believe that if you put like a thing in your mouth it'll have an effect or whatever okay let's transition to our break um take our gorilla derived brain pills for maximum focus and power <laughs> and alphaness that's they've made hundreds of millions of dollars grinding up ape dongs to make you virile and powerful that's just alchemy man those are <laughs> herbs, that's what they are. Like you love to point the finger at women for their interests or whatever. Take a look at every alpha blend that they sell on these websites. I wanna interview him and be like, so you believe this pill will make you more of an alpha male? Yes. Is that because you believe in magic? Like, come on guy, I wanna do the interview so bad. Oh God. he. You know they 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 said they had like I think Rashad and Ben went on his little interview show. They'll eventually reach out to you. I can't wait to see. It. You should bring some of those little alchemical brews. <laughs> anyway, okay, we need to move from ape dongs to something arguably more serious. Uh, let's jump into this C block. <clears throat> Martin says, John, drink lots of bone broth too. Look, that's simple enough. Maybe that has some sort of effect. I'm just saying the vast majority of what they sell on these websites is the same exact thing as whatever her money Granger would have brewed up in potions. <music> President Biden is having fun hammering Republicans on a daily basis for their clear desire to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And that's good. We're having some fun, dark branded moments. But Senator Bernie Sanders wants him to go much further, and I hope he's successful. We're gonna tell you about the plan. I just wanna give you an example. Joe Biden just routinely is tweeting out things like Social Security and Medicare are more than government programs. They're a promise we made. Work hard and contribute, and when the time comes for you to retire, we'll be there to help you out. It's simple. If anyone tries to cut Social Security and Medicare, we will stop it. And that's that's good. This is obviously cutting it is incredibly unpopular. We want a president who's going to not only stop it from happening, but also fight on behalf of people. We will see in the end if he is actually as big of a defender as he is saying he is, but that's good. Here's the thing though, in all of this you know, like bravado on social media, there aren't any actual answers about how to strengthen social security. Just stopping it from being cut isn't good enough. There are many people for whom it does not provide enough benefits. And there are serious concerns going forward about the long-term viability of the program under the current setup, the way that it's financed. And so Bernie Sanders is pushing Joe Biden to fully fund it for years and years and years, for seven decades into the future. And all it would take to be clear is expanding payroll taxes on affluent Americans rather than just on the first $160,000 in earnings, which is what the current setup is. So to be very clear, if you make up to $160,000, all of that can be taxed to fund social security. Beyond that, it can't. Why? Because rich people own the government, that's it. Don't you think it should be equal? Why should all of your income be taxed for this system, but not theirs? They still draw from it. They benefit from social security. They benefit from the societal stability and security that having a program like social security brings. So it seems like a relatively easy solution that would fund the program for the better part of a century. We'll get into the politics of it, see if Biden is likely to do it. But Jessica, what do you think about his plan? I mean, Bernie is offering by you know global standards, a very middle of the road answer. Like the, the more progressive response, uh, if you lived in any other country, the, the left would be saying, how about we tax corporate profits and we tax wealth? Like 
Sanders is being a bit conservative compared to the range of policy options by saying, well, we're just gonna tax your income and you know, mm-hmm. not proposing that we touch corporate profits or wealth. It's ridiculous. The debt ceiling fight in itself, of course, is ridiculous because we can afford to fund all of it. Should we cut certain things? Yeah, I think we should definitely cut defense spending. Uh, but the point is, is it's a fake constraint. Uh, that they're imposing, but they're choosing the most popular policies we have with Social Security and Medicare. So it's it's just the whole thing is a bit of a mess, even down yeah. to the good policy proposals that are out there. Yeah, uh, so really fast, the, the political issue that seems to be uh, happening between Biden and Bernie is uh, Bernie wants, I think he has again, like little gap, but it's everyone above $250,000. Their earnings would also be included. Um, Joe Biden doesn't want to do that. Because he has said that no one at that income level would have any additional taxes. And he doesn't want to be called like a flip flopper or a liar, which uh, spoiler alert, you are already being called that on a million different things. So I don't, and by me included, by the way. So I don't know why you'd worried about this one, um, which would be wildly popular. And there are, uh, there's a plan that the Democrats in Congress have put forward that would uh, eliminate the, the cap above the 400,000 mark. So there are, conversations going on about this. Again, the idea that the Republicans in the House would approve of something like this seems difficult to imagine. But at some point, this does need to be solved. And reminder, the Republicans have only been in control of the Congress for a little bit. In theory, something like this could have been done when Democrats had unified control of government. But that's another thing that they unfortunately didn't get done. Okay, everybody, we got some weird stories to get into in this block. Let's uh, let's unleash them now. Pretty much anything going on behind the scenes with Kirsten Cinema is gonna be suspect, but even I wasn't expecting that a deep dive, an analysis of the financial situation of her security team would involve the sister of Tulsi Gabbard. What is going on? And, and maybe that's not the part that's most interesting to you. Maybe the fact that she spent over three hundred thousand dollars on security in just recent years is. The big number, but um, either way, this is some interesting stuff. Let's jump into uh, what the Daily Beast has found. So, Kirsten Cinema apparently spends more of her campaign funds on security than nearly anyone else in Congress. Nearly five hundred and sixty thousand dollars since late twenty twenty one, and that's a lot to spend legally on your security. It's more likely what you've spent on your security that's not entirely legal. That's the way that it works out. We're going to give you the details. Uh, Apparently, her campaign committees have paid a combined $307,000 to a group that's registered in Arizona called TOA Group, LLC. And apparently, documents behind the TOA Group show that they have just one officer, Vrinda Van Gabbard Bellord, best known as the sister and occasional spokesperson for Tulsi Gabbard. It's the only person, the only executive working at that company happens to be the sister of Tulsi Gabbard, which is interesting. Now, Cinema and Gabbard have been friends since 2013. I wanna be clear that I didn't know that, but now it seems like the most obvious predictable thing in the world that they were buddies. But anyway, uh, since fall 2021, Bellord has been employed as the security director in Cinema Senate office, a role that has paid her over $50,000. She's uh, apparently been the exclusive security provider to Cinema's campaign. And interestingly, that exclusivity doesn't just mean that she's the only person doing it for Cinema. It means that's the only person she does it for. Doesn't have any other clients. All of this, Jessica, could be perfectly understandable and legal, if a bit weird. But it is definitely weird along the way. What do you think? Why does she need so much security? I I don't know. For security, I just don't sell my soul to the political establishment. And it's worked out pretty well for me. It keeps me out of trouble. Uh, uh-huh. Maybe she should try it. I don't know. The Gabbard Cinema duo is amazing. It's like the Wario and Waluigi of Thelma and Luis. <laughs> like <laughs> they're a predictable pair and an evil one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the the use of campaign funds in this way, it's like they want to live the lifestyle of celebrities. But it would look really bad if they had the the salary of many celebrities. And so instead. They get a bunch of campaign donations and just say that they're always campaigning and they write off their expenses as campaign expenses. And that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah, it looks like it. I mean, 
But beyond the 50,000, Cinema's campaign committee and personal PAC have spent over $240,000 in other security related expenses, which include, and this is what Jessica was sort of alluding to, airfare, lodging, meals, and other benefits for the security detail. 56K for lodging at Marriott hotels alone, two charges totaling over $100,000 for a security detail vehicle. And to be clear, she gets to have security. I think that especially now, everyone in politics, particularly Democrats, needs to have security. But no, I do not believe that she is the most uniquely targeted person in Congress. Nobody should threaten her or try to assault her or anything like that. I also think that she should leave politics. Um, but anyway, the, the amount that's being spent here seems crazy. And then there's stuff besides that. Her personal pack paid $95 to a fat bike tour company in Park City, Utah. Just days before that, Bellard had posted a photo to Instagram showing two bikes with admittedly fat wheels. Uh, and there was a response to the photo uh, from a, a comment from Tulsi Gabbard. And Bellard said, thanks to our friend with a winky face emoji and cinema like that post. So I don't understand what possible interpretation of this there could be other than that cinema paid 95 bucks. So Bellord could go snow biking, which doesn't seem related to security. I don't know. Look, we have a pretty you know easygoing approach as a country to campaign finance. We let them get away with a lot. But I feel like as with almost everything else, uh, cinema's not content to just get away with stuff. She wants to rub it in our faces. Well, anyway. she thought she would get the the fat bike vote by posting that. <laughs> <laughs> Big bike, I call that industry. <laughs> anyway, um, there's other stuff too, but I think we, we need to move on. We're gonna go just slightly over. I wanna get to this last story with the time we have remaining. So we're gonna see what happens with cinema. Um, she's a senator, so I have a feeling she's probably gonna end up being okay. Okay, with that said, let's jump into this. Generally, when you hear the term like fetal personhood being thrown around, it's being used to justify effectively outlawing abortion, stripping away people's reproductive rights, all of that. Uh, we have a new use of it, an innovative one. Let's see what you think of this. A lawyer is arguing that the fetus of a jailed pregnant woman is being illegally detained because it possesses fetal personhood. So who are you to lock it up? It didn't commit any crimes and it has constitutional rights. Here's some of what they say in their legal filing. The unborn child has not been charged with a criminal offense by respondents or the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. Yet respondents have unborn child in a detention center known as TGK in Miami-Dade County, Florida. It further alleges that the jail has failed to provide Harold, that's the woman who is pregnant with the fetus that now is a person, with adequate prenatal nutrition and medical care saying that she has not been treated by an obstetrician gynecologist since October. And on one occasion was left out inside a transport van with inside temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period. An unborn child is a person, the lawyer says, and a person has constitutional rights that can't be de deprived without due process of law. Uh, Jessica, this is an interesting novel use of this. What do you think? Well, you're you're a philosophy guy. I assume you have some background in logic, and things get really fun when logic goes out the window. Because mm -hmm. if the fetus is a person, is being in the womb at all illegal detainment? I mean, it's not free to leave the stomach. <laughs> is that right? What where does that leave us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, when you do a C-section, like who are you to kidnap the fetus from that? Place? They didn't consent to that. Um, look. And, and that's what a lot of the, like I think, reasonable activists on the other side are pointing out, like uh, pregnancy justice, a group that says this movement is gaining traction, but it's just still a fringe idea. Like it's been put into law, but it is this crazy thing to think because there are so many obvious consequences of it, including things like HOV lanes and stuff like that. Uh, realistically, they would have you would have to make all sorts of exceptions to what personhood rights should be given to someone who's still a fetus and someone who has been born. Uh, so much so that at the end of the day, what what is the point of this? The issue that we will face as a movement is that they don't care about that because they don't really mean it. They're not trying to put forward a consistent logical philosophy here. They're trying to find a shortcut, a get out of jail free card that lets them outlaw abortion. So they've got that. This is interesting. I'm curious what's gonna happen, but it's not gonna solve our problems. 
Anyway, unfortunately, the hour has shot by. So that's all the time we have for the first hour of the show. But there is much more to come in the aftermath with Jessica Burbank. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.